Hello, and welcome to today's talent track with Milan Bergheim and his project Rebert PeatLab. I'd like to welcome everyone on Zoom and on LinkedIn Live. For all of you on Zoom, please mute your mics and turn on your camera. It's much nicer to see each other. Feel free to join the Q&A after the presentation. You can ask questions in person, post them to the chat or on LinkedIn. We will bring them into the session. My name is Hannah Freudenberger. I'm a project manager of the UX Design Awards at International Design Center Berlin, in short, IDC. The awards organizer. The IDC is a leading German nonprofit design institution. We are a professional association that connects designers, design agency, and companies with more than 50 years of expertise. Our mission is to promote design as a driver of innovation in business and society. This is also why we founded the UX Design Awards in 2015, to promote the positive impact of people-oriented design worldwide, and to recognize the people and talents involved in shaping the design. On that note, I'd like to remind you that our call of entry is open right now until the end of November. So if you're working on some great experience design, no matter if products, services, prototypes, or visionary concepts, we'll be glad to welcome your work in our competition. In our ev virtual event series, we invite awarded designers and teams to talk about UX work and share knowledge with our professional community. You can join us twice a month for deep dives featuring professionals and companies and ta talent tracks presenting up and coming UX designer. To stay tuned, follow us on LinkedIn and social media or subscribe to our newsletter. And now let me introduce you today's award-winning project, Rebert PeatLab. Dealing with the global task to become climate neutral, this project offers a measuring device to accelerate the rewetting of peatlands and to simplify comprehensive peatland monitoring by collecting data in a digital, in a digital twin. The rewetting of peatland can save up to 7% of Germany's CO2 emissions and can emerge a new carbon neutral agriculture economy. The project Rebert Peat Lab won a gold award in the category Nuke Talent and was developed by Milan Bergheim from Weissensee Kunsthochschule Berlin as his master thesis. Milan is a product designer with a focus on system and service design. He, he also has a background in media design and is currently working on the implementation of his project. Milan, welcome. Please take it from here. The screen is yours. Hi, my name is Milan. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. And um, yeah, I think uh, you said pretty much uh, about it. And um, I will go straight to my presentation. So you see my, my full screen? Okay. So um, yeah, I'm very glad that you are here today. I'm very glad to be here today. <clears throat> and I'm still very honored to have uh, received this um, gold award. And today I will talk about how I came across the topic, peatlands, and I will give you some facts about them and show you my design process. And of course, I will explain the product and the service. Um, but first, in short, so you know what uh, you're dealing with, um, rewet is a service concept to accelerate the rewetting of peatlands. It combines existing data with on-site data provided by its own measuring device, the PETLAB. And this device is meant to be in the hands of the land users, which are most of the time farmers. So let us start with this beautiful picture, which tells a little bit how I came about the topic. Um, around three years ago, someone told me um, that um, she couldn't open her windows in Moscow because of so much uh, smog and fog in around 2010. And that was because uh, there were peat um, burning. So um, this, picture show, this picture shows smoldering peat fires around Moscow in 2010. It was taken by ESA from space. Um, and my thought was, how can they burn? Aren't peatlands wet? So peatlands are marshes, right? So um, I researched and I fell for the topic. Um, 
I it was about the same time that I had to pick a topic for my master thesis, and I tossed it into the room with other topics, and finally uh, decided to stick with it. So. Why did I uh, stick with it? Um, I wanted to show that as a designer, I can have an impact in a, in a field which is not a typical designer's playground, like chairs, new materials, or mobility. And that is a question I've been asked a lot. Isn't uh, peatlands a topic for someone in agriculture or geology? And a friend always said, well, Milan, it's not a sexy topic. You have to know that. Um, so my answer was always, well, I think it might be helpful if this topic is tackled with a designer's mindset and maybe we can make it sexy. And I started with um, desk research and collected newspaper articles um, like this. And most of the time it was uh, the articles were telling, okay, peatlands are very important for us. And uh, some of them are telling they are very hard to extinguish. Um, and some of you might not know, but uh, peats are like, um if we if, if we would take them a, f a few thousand years further they would uh, emerge into coal and then into um um oil so um yeah how did i proceed from newspaper articles i started to read articles about polluted culture which uh, means that our techniques to farm wet peatlands and process the genuine biomass into promising materials I studied management plans of um, peat, peat renaturation of peatlands and uh, even stuff like this paper. I like it, uh, like the title a lot. It's called Unraveling the Importance of Polyphenols for Microbial Carbon Mineralization in Rewetted Riparian Peatlands. Um, yeah, this is just a short excerpt of all the articles I read. Um, but I also read other, other stuff. So my professor, she recommended me to read the ethnologist and sociologist Claude Levi Strauss. And I didn't know him, so I researched and uh, to find something he might have written about marshes, peatlands, or myers. And what came closest was um, his book, um, Traurige Tropen, or Tris Tropiques from 1955. And at first, I did not really know why I'm reading it. And honestly, I only cross-read a part of it, but it brought me the insight that already in the 50s, the author had the feeling that the world was being increasingly traveled and exploited to the last corner. And well, many of us think or have the feeling that this is uh, today still the case. And some of, some of us might not think that uh, people had that feeling 50 years ago or 70 years ago. And it opened my eyes to the fact that almost the whole world around us is um, man-made, so there's no genuine nature left. And when I read about Myers, it always came through that they are children of the Holocene, um, an era with minimal temperature amplitudes, and a it's a perfect surrounding for us humans too. So uh, the Holocene is like 10,000 years old. And, but now there's a circle of scientists claiming that we now live in the Anthropocene. And, um, that means that the humanity has been a contributory factor in the climate equation. And I would say I'd support that. Um, so why I'm mentioning, mentioning reading this book is that um, at first I had the idea of simply designing a fancy, good looking measuring device for greenhouse gases. But however, studying the topic of anthropological land use showed me how interconnected everything is and that if you really uh, want to make a change or have an impact, you have to delve deeper into the interconnections so you can actually create change. Um, to bring that uh, a little bit more into um, context with these uh, pristine landscapes, when uh, we Germans think about uh, Urwald or pristine forests, some might say, well, we have the Reinhardt, but don't we? But I looked into that and uh, it's a really beautiful forest and um, looks very ancient, but actually it is only shaped the way it is because uh, like 200 years ago, we let um, cattle and pigs there to pasture. So yeah, everything uh, we do um, results in something and uh, on a very long time base. So what happened to our peatlands? Around the 18th century is uh, when Germany started to drain 
uh, their Myers. Um, and this guy is called Jürgen Christian Pindorf. He started to colonize the Teufelsmoor. And since then, 97% uh, of Germany's peatlands have been drained to provide farmland to mine peat. And of course, because it's excellent fuel or even to settle on it. And around 1900, first attempts were made to protect peatlands, um, mainly for scientific reasons. And uh, this picture shows pretty well a uh, stakeholder conflict between uh, nature preservation and uh, economic interests. So um, the organic form spot in the middle is what's been left of that giant um, peatland, and everything square shared around it is um, yeah, in economic use. So now you might wonder um, what um, is a peatland and why is it worth uh, to be uh, worked on? So when you flip uh, through the book Project Drawdown, you find peatlands ranked as number 13 most important lever to stop global warming. And I learned also a lot from this fantastic book. It's called The Wise uh, Use of Myers and Peatlands. And uh, whenever you have a question about um, these landscapes, Google that book, it's uh, accessible for free and it has an answer to almost everything. And one of the authors is Hans Joosten and he won the Deutsche Umweltpreis last year for his achievements uh, for peatlands. And I'm very um, lucky that uh, Professor Hans Joosten was one of the many people who advised me on the project. So now let's get to some facts. Peatlands are emitting about twice the amount of uh, CO2 of air traffic globally. And how is that possible? So to understand this, we go a few centimeters underground in a mire. And as um, there might be listeners today from various cultural backgrounds, I first want to clarify the term peatlands and mire. So um, in this chart, you have peatlands uh, on the right and non peatlands on the left. And myers are always peatlands as they produce peat and contain peat. And all the other landscapes are uh, landscapes who can contain peat or can produce peat, but in general, they aren't. And if they aren't, uh, they are not peatlands. Um, and myers are permanently wet landscapes, and they are a carbon sink if they are in their natural state. Um, peatlands were formed in post-glacial depressions, Water collected on impermeable soil, that plant remains of pioneer plants sedimented and were protected uh, from oxygen by the water. A high polyphenol content and an acidic environment inhibited microbial decomposition processes, and high water levels and harsh solar radiation meant that these landscapes did not become forested. And so peat landscape, landscapes developed since the last ice age, so within the Holocene, and uh, today they account for about 3% of the um, land mass worldwide, and they contain 30% of our carbon. Whilst forests, the darker one here, they, they cover 31% of uh, the land mass, and they store only 15%. So, because you can't eat anything from them except for a few berries, people in Germany started draining them, well, and all around the world, of course, too. And that has serious consequences. When peatlands are drained, the peat is exposed, and carbon and oxygen combine to form uh, CO2. And in Germany, peatlands emit about 23 times the amount of our domestic air traffic. If you want to see a peatland, sometimes, Depending on where you live, you can um, Google one and visit it. So if you're in Berlin, you're quite lucky. Um, I found one close to Müggelsee, and that is that type is a bog. So um, and this one was in a state of renaturation when I first approached it, and it might be today too. Um, well, it's a very special place. The soil is soggy, and even though it was already warm, uh, the mosses were still icy and fog was laying on the ground. But most of the time, you will pass a peatland without recognizing it because it just looks like uh, farmland, right? Like here. So then what do we do? Uh, peatlands are emitting a lot of uh, CO2, and uh, but don't we need them to produce our food? Well, um, in general, we just need to put back water into the peatlands to, peatlands to keep the peat protected from oxygen, and soon they stop emitting CO2. 
but what about farming them? Um, you don't want to sink into the soil like this. So thanks to institutions like the Greifswald Meyer Center and other innovators, cultivation techniques and uh, raw material processing have been developed. So this one is using a piss pulley um, to, to drive over his uh, soggy meadow. And um, you can cultivate peat mosses and use them for horticulture. Um, you can grow a certain type of uh, forest on them and produce uh, wood. Um, you even can uh, produce meat on those um, rewetted peatlands if you use uh, water buffaloes. Um, and you can make uh, really good carbon neutral or even um, climate positive uh, building materials with uh, even higher static values, as I think. So at this point of research, I thought, well, that's the point. It all comes down to the farmer. We just need to have we just have to activate the farmers and equip them with the means to rewet and start with polluting culture. So I even found a guide for farmers to assess their land for rewetability. I started uh, to map uh, first journey and identified pain points, mostly in the using process of this, and thought, well, that's um, that's the way to go. So I have something which is scientifically proved, and I can use my designer's mindset to make this one uh, more easy, better functioning, more accessible. Um, I looked uh, for touch points. How could I develop a service around it? And I developed the idea to implement a toolkit, send it to the farmers and guide them through the process. I started prototyping and started uh, making little designs. And uh, I refined a user journey to yeah, delve deeper into it and um, be able to uh, communicate there. So the farmer would aid the farmers in this process to rewet their land. They would just provide their plots geodata we would gather information and make it comprehensible for the farmer. On the other hand, farmers would carry out guided measurements and rewet the land with our toolkit, which you see on the left on the very right. Um, and um, in the end, um, they would be able to evaluate their greenhouse gas flows and make money from it in addition. Um, I sketched out all those sub-processes of um, peat probing and um, talked with peatland scientists about it, how that works, and um, sketched out a, a few phases how the whole transition uh, would work. And at the same time, I was already in contact with uh, two peatland scientists. One is Dominic Sack from the Aarhus University, and he clarified a few things uh, from the beginning for me. Like one idea was to make micro peatlands and put them on rooftops. Um, so he said that wouldn't work because they are very good in storing peat, but they are not the most efficient in, in, in quick capture. Uh, so that's where you would need tiny forests. And um, he recommended me to another guy named Wendelin Wichmann, and he's from the Weizsäcker Bio Center. And with him together, I started to develop this process. And at that point, he said, well, uh, Milan, it would make sense if you present that in, in front of our uh, regular um, um, workshop meeting with all staff involved in peatland projects. So I accepted and wrote an invite. And I thought, OK, that's it was like August. I thought maybe five people come and will um, give me some insights. But I opened the. Um, our um, big blue button and uh, everybody was there, like all the people uh, whose, uh, all the authors whose papers I, I uh, read in the months uh, before, uh, just popped out with a picture and I, I was really nervous because I thought, okay, this is like uh, the peatland elders and they, they will rip my pro project apart and maybe I got it all wrong. And um, somehow they did. Um, it was uh, quite an extensive and staggering uh, feedback round, and some argued quite heatedly. And um, yeah, most of them saw problems primarily in digital solutions um, because they've been working directly with farmers for like decades, and um, they, sh they shared all the problems uh, they they saw in the process. And but the most important reaction came from Hans Josten, and he said. 
um, bottom up won't work. That's like expecting miners to start the coal phase out. And the drainage, uh, he also said that the drainage of miners is a cause of societal needs. And the rewetting of peatlands is a societal re responsibility, um, as global warming is a societal threat. Um, plus, the rewetting of peatlands has at least the same dimension at the coal phase out. So we don't just save 7% uh, of our emissions by um, putting out a toolkit on the market. So, um, yeah, the feedback round helped me to to sort the things I already had, and I had most insights about what uh, really needs to be measured. But um, yeah, it threw me threw me back because I thought, okay, now now I can can start to design the toolkits and uh, work on the service. Um, so I went back into uh, reading some more stuff, and uh, there. There has been a big conference uh, last year with the renewable resources from, um, uh, sorry, um, yeah, it's a, a, a big peatland, a uh, European peatland conference, and um, I picked some key messages, and they, one was that uh, polluted culture can only be a small part in a large solution, so you have to go landscape scale. And uh, I had to look into landscape finance to have uh, more money on the scale. And the other thing was that policy instruments have to be radical because incremental change uh, confuses the stakeholders too much. So I needed to know what uh, landscape finance means. And this uh, book, the Little Sustainable Landscapes book, uh, manages to convey in a very compact way what landscape finance is about. So if you want to achieve change, you have to plan at landscape level. So depending on the project, several factors play a role here. And you don't go like, look, here's a 200 hectare plot on sale. Let's buy it and change it for good. Uh, so the landscape approach is more to find clusters based on uh, geographical uh, boundaries and more, and uh, you set goals, and then you develop a concept that involves all stakeholders, regardless of factors such as administrative boundaries. And you look at producers, users, consumers, but also the landscape with catchment areas. The project size then comes into a range where larger investors with lot sizes of 100 million euros and more would be willing to get involved. So here I have my um, um, yeah, I had access to planning documents and I contacted another guy, uh, his name is Bas Panius, and he's a peatland scientist too, but he's uh, working on the ground uh, on landscape transformation processes. And from him, I learned about rentability models, farming premiums from the um, GAP, which is the uh, Gemeinsame Agrarpolitik in uh, Europe. And uh, one crucial thing, that we have a hands egg problem. So because there is no biomass available, nobody invests in processing um, facilities. So there is no market. Um, so farmers do not have an intent to produce um, anything else. So um, The thing is, we need to generate a market to make polluted culture interesting to farmers, because with polluted culture, you produce different kind of crops. And because there's no funding from the gap, you need to adjust the gap model so farmers can retrieve funding for climate positive farming. And then, of course, we have to plan the rewetting. And there is at the moment another problem that uh, is the scale. And uh, we have the Bund Länder Zielvereinbarung in Germany which means we would have to rewet 250,000 hectares until 2030. Um, so that would be 35,000 hectares a year. And at the moment, it's only 2,000 hectares a year. And according uh, to Hans Joosten, we would not even have enough planning capacity to stick to the plan. So I wrote myself a rebrief that I need to simplify the planning process to reduce the re needed expertise. I need to generate a market to solve our hands act problem. And we need to change policies, which is absolutely central. And to make it work, we need to include farmers and create further incentives for them to make it lovable. So what can I do? 
I can create a planning tool and service. To generate a market, clusters need to be formed and to create a basis for landscape finance, um, the clusters are necessary. Um, I cannot change policies, but I can make a proposal to um, and find a lobby. And we could couple funding with cooperation to include farmers in the process. They could help to generate data, but we should also provide workshops for them. And then only um, the only incentive for farmers would be um, a sleek transformation, or of course, higher revenues. I structured my rebrief and mapped it a little bit further. So a policy change would be the first milestone in the framework. And my service would provide data for planning agencies and industry to carry out the rebadging. And it would network between industry landscaping associations and farmers and support farmers with marketing, knowledge, machines, and finance. The tasks for the individual stakeholders would be planning for planning agencies, investing for industry, and uh, the landscaping associations would uh, do networking, workshopping, and lobbying. And um, farmers would need to cooperate to be eligible for funding. And they would be uh, the ones who provide the on-site data with our technology. And um, for them, uh, there's added value created by offsetting their car carbon um, savings. So um, let's move on to the part that I have worked out with versus with, which is the data gathering tool. So at first in a planning agency, multiple layers of maps are gathered from different map services and manually stitched together. When a suitable plot is found, serving engineers are sent to the field to reference the heights as uh, existing models are not accurate enough. Then specialists will take peat samples and install water levels indicators and inspect ranges and uh, trenches. And all this data is put together and combined with other available data, like hydrological maps or climate data. The rewetting is then planned based on this data. And in the meantime, a concept is worked out with the farmers on how to continue farming after rewetting. So that's where I put there, where I put would put my device. And this is what my service would cover or aid, because I do not want to um, substitute uh, planning agencies. Um, in my idea, the farmer would have a measuring device, um, uh, walk over his field um, and provide uh, all data that uh, I identified like uh, the digital terrain model, peat thickness, and water level in ditches, and all the data would be satellite referenced and uploaded into a cloud. Um, then there is another rather big component um, that the device should determine the vegetation composition by using a smartphone's camera. Uh, why is it necessary? Because after rewriting specific vegetation in a peatland um, establishes itself, depending on the water level. And this vegetation provides information about um, the greenhouse gas fluxes via the so-called guest method. Um, this would give farmers ac access to the emission market and has other benefits too. So there we have our incentive. Um, when I started my physical design, um, I always use the morphological box. So I give every component I need a symbol like sensors and direction points, cameras, display, and I put them in context uh, to the user and his environment. So this helps me to set a frame without thinking in shapes. Um, and then the next thing is grabbing something and making first models. Usually for me, it's paper or cardboard. And um, yeah, this is from a um, dust, dust extractor. Um, and yeah, I bought this uh, plastic pole and started uh, with more paper and, and colors so I could see how I could arrange everything on the device. And for me, it's always important to work in scale one um, to cover um, all the ergo ergonomics too. Um, what I then do is photo documenting it so I can kind of prove the process. 
and analyze what's going uh, right or wrong. And here I wanted to implement a handle for soil drilling, um, which was uh, very much changed in the end. Um, so here's see a bit more about the uh, finding a size. I also took it to a car. I tried to put it on my cargo bike to see uh, which is the maximum length. Um, so, and I used driver form uh, to make ergonomic models and used uh, like rapid prototyping techniques like 3D printing. Um, and I took it to the field to see how it would actually work. Um, and also, tape renderings helps yeah, to find a shape. Um, and yeah, so here, the, that's the final shape. And um, well, for me, it's somehow ergonomics with a reduced curvature. And uh, some might ask, why is it black and yellow? Uh, it's not typical farmland uh, colors. Well, black gives it sturdiness. And I think it will have a nice touch to it when it's aged and scratched. And yellow is the color of surveying. Survey. So it's not green to have contrast in front of uh, green meadows, and it's not white or blue, as it's no medical device. Uh, the basic shape is lent from a so-called Firkauer soil drill. Uh, soil drills are a standard tool for peatland scientists. Uh, they use it to drill in the soil. So the drill part is a half open tube, so the soil can be removed after drilling. Um, here you see it uh, on a human. And on the top of it, uh, the control unit is mounted. So the control unit accommodates a GPS antenna, Bluetooth for the smartphone connection, uh, the battery, a laser distance meter, and a trigger button and slides on from the top. So the sensor shuttle, which is the lower part, it's uh, movable on the drill rod and functions in various modes. A uh, smartphone is attached to the top of the device for additional controls, visual and auditive feedback, and um, above all for its uh, camera to perform uh, vegetation scans. Um, for one reason, the device only has one trigger button uh, because wet and cold and dirty hands can make it annoying to operate a touch screen. So the interaction is mainly based on one button. Uh, the electronic components are detachable. So you can uh, take it to the office and charge uh, or give the other parts the readings. Um, so, now let us go to a peat lab and see how the peat lab uh, would be used as demonstrated on a early prototype here. Um, so on the field, the peat lab is set up, sensor is attached, GPS is attached, smartphone is mounted, and the device uh, connects with Bluetooth to the smartphone. So an app links uh, to the unit, uh, links the unit to the database and guides uh, the user through the process. So we measure altitude, as I told, to reference the existing DGM-1 uh, models and brings it down to an accuracy of uh, one centimeter plus minus. Um, so um, we go to the first spot, and in this mode, the sensor is in the lower position for flat ground contact, and the short button press triggers an altitude reading, and the data is stored to the cloud. The app confirms the data and leads over to the next step, which would be monitoring peat thickness um, that helps to keep track of degradation and accumulation processes. And it's important to define the baseline emissions. So to measure the peat thickness, the sensor is pushed upwards, uh, handle is inserted into the mount with more force when drilling it uh, into the peat body. And as peat is softer than the soil beneath, the drill will stop when you uh, reach like hard bedrock. And then the sensor helps to reference the distances. Everything's uploaded, and we go to measuring ditch waters. So sensor is in the lower position, and uh, we push uh, and hold the button. And as soon as the sensor hits the water surface, it triggers an um, altitude reading, sort of as uh, water level. And yeah, that's the measuring part. And vegetation, uh, the next part, gives clues about the water levels and is key to modeling greenhouse gas balances. And it's also relevant for uh, value creation chains later on. Um, that's 
quite simple. So uh, the data is also linked to geodata. And for a scan, you, you, you tilt the uh, smartphone downwards and uh, the app switches to scan mode. Pressing the trigger button starts the scan and you pan left and right. And stops could be um, marked by the Taptic engine. And um, yeah, that's it. So here you see a short overview how uh, the data is combined. So you have the farmer using his peat lab, his or her peat lab, and um, this loads uh, to uh, the Rebird map services or cloud services. Um, and um, where we would gather all other maps like historical maps, hydrological maps, further data, and the DTM1 model. And this is um, sent to planning agencies or made available for planning agencies so they could um, do their planning faster. Um, this is my service blueprint, which includes also phases what would happen on. Uh, um, governmental um, layer or what, what the platform would provide, what the agencies uh, would do um, when operating on this landscape level, um, what farms would do, and the industry, and of course, um, I have, sorry, I have problems with the mouse all the time, and I don't see uh, the picture, um, yeah, and it's structured in a few phases, but I'm not uh, yeah, going through uh, this map now, but I transformed it into something more graspable. Um, so, yeah, I think you can look at the presentation um, on the UX uh, Design Awards website later on. So uh, feel free to find it and uh, yeah, take some time looking um, or ask me later. So. Um, yeah, with this slide, I want to honor all my network partners. Um, I'm still amazed about the enthusiasm with which I was helped. So uh, anyone I contacted or wrote an email, uh, everybody took their time to explain me things like how RTK GPS uh, or GNSS uh, would work. There was the company PPM and Liker uh, took time like to answer like 10, 15 questions about greenhouse gas monitoring, which turned out to be far too expensive. And that's why uh, the guys at Maya Center developed this uh, guest method where you go from vegetation to water levels to um, greenhouse gas fluxes. I had uh, Tia Kettenbaum from the Leipzig University who helped me to understand how uh, pattern recognition would work to figure out how the vegetation detection, uh, if that would be viable. Um, yeah. And uh, just recently, um, I made contact to a company uh, or a startup called Zukunft More. They're actually trying to buy a plot of a thousand hectares. Um, and I pitched my idea to them and they said, well, uh, your, your idea would just fill the gap uh, we ident identified in our process because they have one guy um, working uh, 20 hours a week and he's uh, very um, a specialist in GIST data. Um, specialists in peatlands and uh, yeah. so and there's another um, startup or agency I, I make contact with uh, they are named farm food climate challenge um, so they will help me to put everything in context and at the moment I'm um, funded by Design Farm Berlin which is a design and tech accelerator uh, to try to uh yeah make the project a uh, reality um yeah feel uh i'd be happy if you scan that code and uh look at my instagram um yeah thank you for listening i hope it was not too much it's 40 minutes now milan so thank you yeah. milan thank you um very much for this very exciting presentation um Maybe you can stop sharing your screen so we can see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. I think I find it quite um, yeah, Im impressive that your project has such an interdisciplinary approach. Um, I think you also said that interconnections are um, important to create a change. Um, 
So for all of you out there, please post your questions in the chat, or if you're on Zoom, you can just jump into the conversation. Um, Milan, before we dive deeper into um, your project, I would like to know if you could tell us a little bit more about um, the development of the project, like what were your first steps and um, what was the timeline for this whole project? Because it was a master thesis, but this com project seems quite complex. It took quite some time, like, um... Yeah, I thought about that last time. So um, I think I, I prolonged my master's for uh, one semester because I have two kids and we were just facing a, a winter corona situation. And um, I thought I couldn't uh, finish my master's uh, when I have my kids at home. Um, so um, yeah, that was 18 months. And I, yeah, at first I dived into yeah theory, wrote, uh, uh read a lot of newspaper articles and all those i got quite lost in those scientific papers and i had this um uh, through a mutual connection i i had this contact to uh, the um, dominic sack from aarhus and um well first i just yeah did like brainstorming and identified uh, or pre-identified things uh, which could be done like forming micro peatlands on rooftops um, and uh, several other things like maybe tried an educational pro uh, approach uh, also like creating awareness about the um, peatland situation in general um, and um, yeah somehow I have I was inspired by a project um, I've seen from the Lucky Strike Designers Award, uh, which was a device which rice farmers could put in their fields uh, to measure um, water levels. And um, as soon as the water level drops, uh, there's just a red light going on. So the farmer knows, OK, now um, I have to stop watering them um, to prevent too much uh, methane going into the atmosphere. And it was so simple and interesting. So that triggered my, uh, yeah, triggered me somehow. Um, and um, yeah, so I talked to Dominic about that and somehow all those ideas crumbled because uh, he said, well, micro peatlands, I know a guy who, who, who managed to, um, to create a micro peatland in his very huge garden in Brandenburg, he said, but, um they won't uh, sequester so much carbon because uh, their main power lays in well it's just a big storage we have laying there in the ground because uh, we humans didn't tackle so much uh, with these lands for ages so they were for a long time like no man's land you don't go there and we uh, um people uh, threw dead bodies into them to get rid of them um and, and stuff like this so, um, we know that today because uh, this mire water always um, preserves uh, everything organic you throw into it uh, pretty much so you can take uh, I, i've seen a show by zendo mit der maus um, which is uh, german uh, uh, children uh, explanation tv so uh, they threw uh, raw um, pig belly into it and, and took it out a few weeks later and it was well preserved um yeah so um what 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 took the project further was yeah actually talking to the people who are working on it for 20 30 years and these are the guys uh well it's a bit unfair that i'm only mentioning uh the guys of my center because there are more um institutions like this in germany um but uh yeah they are working together with farmers and, and the whole situation for like 20, 30 years, and they are quite experienced in the whole thing. And they are, yeah, I have the feeling they are stuck somehow. Yeah. Hmm. Actually, um, I have a question about, uh, about that. Um, so if I understand it right, you were working with an organization of peatland scientists. Um, <laughs> but as you said, in the end, it all comes down to the farmers. So um, how were they included into the user research process? And 
What were the challenges here? Um, honestly, I didn't really talk to farmers. Um, only um, it is more like speculative uh, the whole thing because the process I'm I'm um, uh, I'm working on is uh, it it doesn't really have um, a use case at the moment. So you cannot go like um, yeah, would you use that and would you take it uh, to your peatland and um, but. Um, for me, they play that very um, central role in the whole process because um, they are working those lands and um, they need to make a living from it. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to um, um, develop an, a, a concept that they do not um, have to uh, compromise too much uh, from the change. Uh, at mm. least not um, money or income wise and maybe it um, helps them to um, yeah to to love the project more if if they they, have, they need incentives that's the most thing so um, so what what the guys people told me is that um, farmers need numbers and they 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 need an incentive to do that and um, so that's what brought me first to changing uh, policies, because at the moment you get uh, funded for growing corn and stuff like this on those peatlands, which is um, a bad thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, no wonder why they're uh, farming the land like this, because this is the only way to farm it and make money from it, and they make the, they need to make their living. So. Sure. Um, yeah, sure. In the end, the farmers should also benefit from the change. Yeah, and they if, if they farm the land uh, wet, they are. Um, it's not only that their land then sequesters carbon. There are uh, so many more benefits we would have from uh, rewetting peatlands as they, if they are close to a river, meaning riparian um, areas, they would also filter water help to um, buffer water when there's a lot of rain coming um, and they could um, yeah so that would be retention and the other thing would be buffering to help over dry seasons so um, what they would uh, get would be that they can um, they have add value because um, when they do that uh, we could monetize them for doing that and uh, the other thing is uh, it's their land if we send uh, surveying people on their land to survey everything um it's um yeah they're kind of excluded so they're more that would be even more top down so if we include them give them the measuring device they um uh can take their land a little bit like a shepherd um yeah and they know it best yeah yeah absolutely um actually there's a question from um our colleagues from the German Eco Design Awards, they're, they're wondering if um, the peat lab is already in use or could it be in use at the stage where it is right now? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, and I, I was pitching it on Friday at the Degut um, and some guy uh, approached me too and he said, wow, uh, what you're doing is exactly what I need because I want, uh, I have an idea to fund, uh, to, to, to make something uh, with peatland biomass and I need uh, to know where I can get this biomass. So um, does it already work? But uh, no, it doesn't. So that for me, it's uh, the next step to find out how to develop um, the hardware and the software um, to um, pilot uh, that and um, I think I picked quite a, quite a good moment for that because um, like around this like a half a year ago um, the startup um, Zukunft More launched and they are trying to buy a thousand hectares which is like um, yeah, 10 times the size of plots that have been rewetted at once before I want, they want to start a um, yeah. They want to build the nucleus of a first polluticultural cluster. So they identified seventeen clusters in Germany, 
where um, um, where there would be each parcels of a hundred thousand hectares, and um, so I would have the first um, yeah people to to try it out then somehow. Okay, so um, like you said, your project is still a prototype or in the concept phase, and um, apart from funding and um, policy changes. What what um how do you plan to turn it into a functioning business model? I mean, what are the key um challenges here? Um, yeah, that's what I'm working on with a coach at the moment. So um for me as a designer, that's uh, a very hard part because I don't know much about business development. I don't know about uh, electronic hardware prototyping. Um and I don't know much about GIS data. And um, yeah, for I, I just have the feeling that at the moment, yeah, my my experience ends, and I need more uh, more people to um, join the um, yeah to embark the boat. And uh, so yeah, that's actually my homework at the moment. My coach gave me to find out how to um, how to make the next step. So what do I need to um, produce a prototype and um, to work a pilot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this was also a question from the audience. Where do you see obstacles for realis realization and how could they be overcome? Um, but I think you, you answered. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah, at the do moment, have... there, there's also the problem. So so I have my customer number one. Um, but uh, most probable, uh, they will make it without me. So because they have, uh, they, um, I think they have a good team and they have uh, people who do everything manually, which I would do a little bit uh, faster and smarter. Um, but somehow, um, Everybody hopes, uh, or or I hope, and they hope, and and many other people hope that they will, uh, and that's the idea of the project: how to 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 bring that uh, rock into rolling. Um, so then a market uh, would develop. And uh, the other thing is that we have this. Um, so we have the Paris Climate Agreement. We have the uh, Bund Länder Zielvereinbarung. So we somewhere on the polit political agenda there is that we have to do that. And um, we know that we can't do it uh, with the means we have at the moment. So someone will happen. So of course, there is a lot of room for iteration in my uh, product and service. Um, but I'm totally open to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so like you said, I mean, they're actually working a lot of scientists um, on yeah on the rewetting of peatlands so how does your project um stands out from existing projects um yeah that's a good question so i can compare it to other uh, design projects so what i found um that there is a very nice amazing project about uh, peatland uh, monitoring from a few years ago um and uh, the designer, she was proposing to have drones um, carrying around um, like um, measuring devices uh, around the peatlands, um, which is a method where you, it's called Haubenmethode, I don't know. It's something you put on the soil and you let the soil uh, do its uh, greenhouse gas fluxing. And uh, from that um, little container, you can, uh, pull all the data and if you do that manually you have to be very uh, careful and it takes a lot of time uh, to do that and she said okay let's do it with a drone and I think that's very clever um, and there are there's a project about uh, building a polluted culture tiny house um, so to use all those uh, beautiful products you can make from polluted culture biomass but um, and all those projects are uh, interesting and um, very important. What 
kind of they defer to mine that mine tries to um tries to take a holistic view on the whole system so it's more a systemic approach and um for me it was more important to understand the whole uh, system how everything is interconnected to each other and then i try to design something haptic which kind of serves as a uh yeah as a, a vessel to communicate the topic to and at the same time it came out that there is um something to measure and that the, the device would make sense too yeah i think what is so special about your project is also that you um put um the farmers in the center of the whole project as i understand it mm -hmm. So, okay, one last question. When we look into the future, where do you see yourself with Rewet Peat Lab in, let's say, two years? So I, I hope in a few uh, weeks or months, I know how to set up um, a team. Um, I, I'm funded uh, until March at the moment. So of course I need more, uh, more funding then, but for further funding, I need to be more precise about what I'm doing. Um, so I'm starting to plan on piloting now, and I hope um, I will have a functioning uh, pilot maybe within a year or a year and a half, and uh, turning that into a business by yeah by by today in two years yeah. Okay, yeah, good good luck. So um, Milan. Thank you very much for these insights and yeah, good luck with the next steps with Greenwood Pietler. Um, thank, thanks to everyone for joining us. We would love to welcome you again in one of our upcoming events. Check out our awards website to see our next events and follow us on LinkedIn, social media, or subscribe to our newsletter. Have a lovely day, morning or evening, and see you soon again. Bye.